song books, please. Turn to page number two. Let's stand and sing glory to his name. All four verses, please. Number two. you're here. Thank you for coming this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time, and Brother Matt Reed's going to come and lead our prayer. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity to stand before you. We ask, Lord, that you'd bless this hour. We ask you to meet the needs of our church family this morning. I ask you to be with our pastor, that you'd speak through him. Pray if there's one here that's lost, Lord, that this be a day of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and dying for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated, please. Be seated, please. I'm thankful that you're at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church on this Labor Day weekend. I appreciate so much you being here. You could do us a favor, please, if you would, this morning. We'd appreciate you helping us with this. If you're visiting day with us for the first time or for the first time in a long time, we'd like to fill out a visitor's card. You can keep the ink pen, fill the visitor's card out, and put in an offering, and put in the offering plate here in just a moment. Our ushers are going to walk this way, and if you're visiting there for the first time or first time in a long time, just raise your hand up just for a second. We're not embarrassed you. We just want to give you a card and let you fill it out for us. We appreciate you being here. You helping her out, Frank? All right, good. I met Brother Larry before church, and Frank's helping this lady out, and he's focused from North Carolina, Indiana. This lady works over at the hospital. I see her occasionally. Where? Oh, and then a choir. We got one in the choir visiting this morning. We invite them to come in the choir here. This young man here. Give him a card. A card. He, he's helping us out today. I appreciate it. And who? Oh, Rick's cousin. Did she get a card? All right. Good. Good. All right. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate your faithfulness to be here. Let me remind just a few things now, if I could, please. Next Sunday morning, Dr. J. Harold Smith's going to be with us. We'll have Sunday school at 10 o'clock. It'll only last a very few minutes. At 25 after the bell will ring. That'll give us about five minutes to get in here and to get ready for the services. I invite you to come early if you wish to do that. And 
But you come to Sunday school, you come to my class, see? That's why you come early, <laughs> and I get to catch you. But you'll have, have to park out in the field, as some of you can, and give some room for our guests. We're expecting a tremendous crowd. We've got a lot of people call about it. Dr. Smith is anxious about coming. It'll just be a blessed time. I want you to be sure and be here. And then I want to encourage you particularly about the International Fellowship of Baptist meeting. We have anywhere from 40 to 50 pastors here from across America on Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. You could help your pastor by just being here and being present. And them just seeing you here and uh, hearing the singing, fellowshipping with each other. The services will not last forever. We'll have two preachers each night, but they'll be good. And uh, you'll enjoy it, I promise you. They're just going to be a good time. And I want to encourage you to be here and enjoy that. This coming Saturday, my wife is speaking at a ladies' meeting down in uh, Rockwood. The van's leaving here. If you ladies want to go at 9 20. Let me encourage you to be sure and uh, go there and support her. And, uh, she'll do a good job as well. And then also that next Sunday is uh, Senior Citizens Day. Uh, oh me or amen. <laughs> and I'll get to celebrate my first grandparents day. A double grandparent. I know I don't look that old do I? <laughs> you folks are slow this morning. <laughs> do I look that old? Be honest. <laughs> Okay, be a liar. I can't tell you what I think of most of you because it's not Christian, all right? So I'll just be quiet. The choir's going to sing for us. You grace.
get our songbooks, please. Let's turn to page 208. We'll stand and sing first and last verse. 208 this morning, please, if you would. Grace then is greater than all of our sins. Ladies are playing, the choir's coming down. I want you to shake hands with those around you. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. Fellowship one with the other, if you would, please. Joe Whitby this morning give you an update on our building programs. So you know where we are. Let's take a few minutes to do that. And we can all go. You'll come do that for us. No, Jesse. You. <laughs> I really go ahead. <laughs> Miss Borm's encouraging me. <laughs> Don't encourage me. Uh, just a quick update about our building. Things are really kind of progressing along at a good pace here. I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the pace we're going. We got word that the uh, comments from the state fire marshal are, are quite minimum. Brother Lackey's working with the uh, AE on that, our architect. I've talked to the architect several times the last two weeks. Uh, we're down into some details like how we're switching the outside parking and everything. The 7th of September, when is that? What's today? It'll be Tuesday. Tuesday. I should have a price on the total project. It's not a bid. Don't get excited. It's not a bid. But it will be a very good engineered price. Our prints have been in the, at the reading room in Knoxville. Uh, many subcontractors have looked at them, and they're feeding that information in. 
and Tuesday around 4 o'clock I should have a very good engineered cost estimate of what the total project will cost us. I plan on bringing that back to the Deacon Board, uh, letting them decide on how to proceed. We've talked in the past about, you know, if we can't afford to do it all, do we do it in phases? But uh, this is a really kind of a milestone for us, and we're really excited about it. The next step will be once we decide on how to progress, we'll start putting it out for bids. Uh, knowing how to progress will, will allow us to know how to go out for bids, whether we phase it or whether we do the whole project. So we're very excited about that and look forward to the next uh, uh, two weeks to a month and getting those cost estimates in. Please continue to pray. We need your prayers. And I never see anything about this over the last year and a half of your giving. I want to thank you for having me reminded you just continually give to our building program and uh, money we've had and we had to spend on different things. I just want to say thank you just for doing that. We're going to receive the offering this morning. If you men will come, Brother Jay, you come and ask God to bless the offering for us. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we're thanking you, Lord, for another privilege you've given us just to meet in your house this morning with our people. And we thank you, Lord, for the word. And we thank you, Father, as it goes forth this morning. If there is one in our midst, Lord, it's lost and undone without you, that they would come to know Christ as their personal Savior. We thank you, Lord, for this time that you have given us to give back a portion of that which you have given us. And we do ask you, Lord, just to bless it to the uh, outreaches of the church and the many missionaries that we support. And we do pray for them this morning, Lord, that wherever they might be, Father, that you would just bless them and give them souls for their labors. Go with all of us now through the day and be in the preaching service and in the uh, after service, Lord, if uh, it is your will, Lord, that that one would come to know you as our personal Savior. We'll give you the praise. And God bless you as you give. Trauber comes to sing for us. The song I'd like to do for you this morning is a song I've done here numerous times. Many of you asked me if I'd do it again. It's called He Came to Me. Uh, it's one of those songs, if you've never needed him, you probably haven't didn't realize it. You'll need him at some point in your life. Uh, if you're not a Christian, I think his song is, was meant for that reason. But I think you can use this song in so many ways in everyday life. So, Craig. The gulf 
that separated me. Christ my Lord, it was so vast the crossing I could never afford. Where I was. I cry, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. Then he came to me. why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was he came to I was bound in chains of my sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently. In his sweet love, I now abide. I'm so glad for the day that he came to me. could not come to where he was he came to me Galatians chapter 1 please the flowers of this morning are in memory of Hazel Coker from Dr. Steve Smith. And I just want to say how thankful I am this morning. I looked out and saw a lot of people visiting with us. With You've had visitors come in on the weekend, and you folks would come. You're our guest today, and you folks are visiting with us. I'm just thankful to have you. I mean that. I say it with all of my heart. I see several folks on the right and toward the back in the middle. See, when I first started preaching, I think the whole world ought to come and hear me. 
But I've tried to preach it a few times. I'm just glad anybody will come. And I'm serious about that too. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6. And if you'll stand with me, I'll only read about seven verses of Scripture. It's good to see an, an old friend I went to school with, Ron French. And you can see him here this morning. I appreciate him coming. <clears throat> Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that's called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have heard that preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I speak to the pleased men? For if I would yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, for this time I'm thankful. And I realize without your help and without your power, without the Spirit of God taking our words and anointing them, we would not accomplish anything. But I pray you'd help me this hour. Do those things that please you and only speak to every heart that's here. Thank you for each person that you individually visit with them. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> now, when I start preaching this morning that some are going to just assume because what I'm talking about that I don't have anything to say to you but I assure you if you'll give me time this morning and give me the opportunity that I'll visit every heart in this room this morning with some words of encouragement and help for you so you bear with me as I get there here we are on Labor Day weekend celebrating the accomplishments that labor has brought to us economically and the benefits we've enjoyed because of the fruits of the labors of others that have preceded us. What convenience we enjoy. What a great country we live in. I love America, don't you? But this hour, this present hour, I want us to consider not the labors of others that are in the sense of uh, those that our forefathers, but the labors of one who travailed at Calvary and the tremendous benefits that are given to us because of the travails of the Son of God at the place called Calvary. He gave us something we did not labor for. This morning on the grace of Christ, or the gospel of the grace of Christ. We live in such an age of bad news, it seems like you hear any good news. But I'm glad to tell you in an age of bad news, there is some good news. I heard the story of an airplane pilot who got on his uh, PA system and said, folks, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. He said, the bad news is we're hopelessly lost. The good news is we're making good time. <laughs> and I'm afraid in this age you and I are living in, folks think they're having a good fast time, but they're heading hopelessly without hope. But we don't have to live hopeless in a hopeless society because we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. I want you to look at four or five things about the gospel, the grace of God this morning. First of all, there's a satanic opposition to the gospel. The devil fought it. Look at verse number six with me, please. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that's called you the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You who would do what? Pervert the gospel of Christ. I mean to tell you that the devil doesn't like the preaching of the gospel of Christ. He loves a social gospel. He perverts the gospel of truth to a social gospel. What I mean by social gospel, if I could just maybe tell you just briefly, is this. That if you're good enough and do enough good things and you're not a bad person, that one of these days you're going to get to go to heaven because you're such a wonderful person. Well, folks, I want to tell you, that just isn't so. Uh, for instance, if you feed enough people and if you're nice and you give enough clothes to people and you make the place where you live a better place, listen, it doesn't keep anybody from going to hell. It only makes the place they're going from nicer. It's all it does. But it's a perverted gospel. 
There's the gospel of the new age that you and I live in, the gospel of reincarnation, that one day you're going to go through enough life cycles, enough life cycles that you'll finally get better and better and better and better. And finally, one day you'll become like God and be a God and that heaven will be. The reason the devil must pervert the gospel is the devil has no raw material to work with. Everything he takes, he taints. Everything he touches, he must have to pervert it. So he perverts the gospel. He takes that which is good and he perverts it and he makes it bad. He doesn't, the devil doesn't deny the gospel. He perverts the gospel. You see, because if you have a false gospel, you can never have a true gospel. If you believe something that's false and think it's true, then you have a harder time believing that which is the truth itself. I guarantee you this morning that you can sit down and make a list of what you believe and what you want to believe and pass it around long enough and you'll find some preacher or some organization that'll agree with you. But that's not how you get to heaven is by getting other people to agree with you or preachers. You get to heaven because of what God's word says about the way you go to heaven. See, this isn't a cafeteria line you pass by and say, I'll take this and I'll take that, I'll take that. No, this is just the truth laid out to you. This is what God has said and we must accept it as being so, you see. There's no compromise with truth. If there is, there is no truth. If you compromise, there is no truth. This is no what so all. You know what? It's interesting that when a preacher goes to preaching, they say, he's just narrow-minded. And if you think that about me, I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate that. I've got a narrow-minded doctor. When I'm sick, he tells me what's wrong with me. Wouldn't you hate to go to a broad-minded doctor and say, well, it's no telling what's wrong with you. Just choose one. When you have a narrow-minded banker, it doesn't matter where you put your money. You just guess, throw a dart somewhere, hit one of them. And I'm going to tell you the gospel is narrow. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul said it this way. Paul said this way. If an angel comes to you and he preaches any other gospel, he said, let that angel be anathema, maranath. He meant, let him be cursed. It's the strongest Greek word you could ever use in language. Let that angel be cursed forever. And if a man comes to you, and that man preaches you another gospel I have not preached to you, let that man be accursed as well. Someone, because the Bible says, the preaching of the cross, that which perishes foolishness, but we which are saved, it is the power of God. We have a perverted gospel. We have many people in our churches this morning who uh, know the church believes but doesn't know Christ personally. They're associated with a building but not with a builder. They're associated with some doctrinal things that they may believe but do not know him who's altogether lovely. And I want to tell you, Christianity is a relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ who's alive and who's well. Now the gospel is described for us in the scriptures. It's not something that Preacher Walls planned out. It's not something that the Baptist grew, uh, drew up. But the Bible, is, the, script, the Bible describes for us exactly what the gospel is. I'm going to show you 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Find your, find your Bible if you're having a hard time finding it. Let someone next to you find it for you because I want you to see what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Ver, and we want to read verse number 3. I'll give you a second to find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse number 3. Let me read verse number 1 to tell you our text here. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Have you found it? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? So this is the gospel he's talking about. Look at verse number 3. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, here it is, how that Christ died for our sins according to the what? 300 prophecies of the Christ's death at one day at Calvary took place when the Son of God died. Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in his death. So here's the gospel. Listen to me now. That Christ died for our sins according to the what? Okay, that's, that's some of the gospel. Let's keep reading. And that he was buried and that he did what? He arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Here's a biblical definition of the gospel. It's this. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he did what? He rose again on the third day. So the gospel is this. The gospel, the good news to all mankind is this, that you and I were sinners. That because we were sinners, we deserved to go to hell. And there was no way we could ever pay ourselves out, pray ourselves out, or anything else, that someone had to pay the sin debt for us. 
And since I could not pay the sin debt and escape hell, you can and you will one day because your sins will either be punished in hell forever or pardoned by Jesus Christ. And because I could not pay the payday myself, the Son of God came and Jesus Christ gave himself at Calvary for my sins. The gospel is this, that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. He was placed in a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to need it very long. Amen. On the third morning, Jesus Christ arose from the dead. That's the gospel. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. And the only way you're ever going to get to heaven is when you realize that you're a sinner. And because you're a sinner, you're going to go to hell. But Jesus Christ paid your sin debt and you repent of your sins and you'll believe the fact that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and he rose again. Gee, God promised to save you if you believe that. No other way. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now listen to me. I will make it clear. I want you to understand. You may never get a chance to hear what I'm going to tell you again. Is this right here. You're not going to go to heaven because you're a nice person. You ought to be nice. You're not going to go to heaven because you belong to a Baptist church, Catholic church, Methodist church, Presbyterian church, Charismatic church. You're not going to heaven because you belong to a church. You're not going to go to heaven because you belong to a club or organization. You're going to heaven because there'll come a day in your life. You repent of your sins. You believe the gospel. Jesus died for you and rose again. And you trust him by faith to save you. That's it. That's it. Not Jesus plus something or Jesus minus something. It's just plainly Jesus Christ. The satanic opposition. You don't preach the gospel without opposition. Acts 13, Paul's preaching. A man tries to interrupt him. I tell you, I, I can be witnessing somebody and the phone will ring. They ain't got a phone call in four days. I will forget, I witnessed you to a man one day and I tried to get him saved for years. I tried to get him saved. Got in his home one night, was witnessing to him. And I said to him, I said, Elmo, don't you want to trust Christ right now? And he had a CB radio on, and the CB radio was quiet. I talked to him for five minutes. When I said, don't you want to be Christ? Somebody said, negatory, good buddy. Satanic opposition to the gospel. The devil doesn't want you to get saved this morning. He'll do anything you can to keep him getting saved. I went to see to a man one day, honestly. The same fellow, Elmo. God, the devil sure didn't want him to, got to get saved. He's not saved to this day, as far as I know. Every time I go through Ohio and something up real high, if I have a few minutes, I'll go by his home, try to witness to him. I want to know Christ. I was witnessing to him one day and asked him to come to know Christ. And a parakeet flew in, he had a parakeet, flew out and landed in my hair. I took that bird and I crushed, I mean, I let it go. I wanted to take its life. I wanted to. I didn't do it. It's a tank opposition to the gospel. Second thing, if you would look at verse number 11 and 12 with me of Galatians chapter 1. Not only is there the satanic opposition to the gospel, the devil fought it. I want to tell you in verses 11 through 12 that God taught it. We have the settled origin of the gospel. But I certify you, brother, I'm telling you the truth. The gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what Paul is telling these people at Galatia? He's saying, I want you to know what I'm telling you didn't come from me. My forefathers didn't tell it to me. I didn't go to some school and learn what I'm telling you. I've learned this by first-hand experience. I certify you that the origin of the gospel is God. When it comes to the gospel, listen to me. Let me tell you something. You don't have the luxury with the gospel of taking your intellect and letting the gospel pass before you and say, well, I think this is better. You don't have that option. It's not an option because the gospel originated from God. You say, well, I don't like that bloody religion where there's a Christ dying on the cross and, and he's dying for my sins. You, listen, you don't have that luxury because God didn't ask you your opinion. God told you the way it was. The origin of the gospel is this. It came from God. God taught it. You may be like Naaman who was a man who had leprosy and uh, a little maid who he had captured in warfare said, Naaman, my preacher could tell you how to get cured. And the preacher, Elijah, sent someone to his house and said, Naaman, so you go down to Jordan and you dip seven times in old Jordan and you'll be cleansed. And you know what Naaman said? He said the same thing many people want to say about Christianity. He said, oh, I thought. I thought he'd just wave his wand over me and I'd get saved. But I want to tell you, he had to follow the instructions of Elijah to be restored to health. And I want to tell you, to you and follow the instruction of God who originated the gospel, you're going to remain lost without God. It doesn't make me happy you're lost. It makes me sad. It makes me sad. I remember the condition when I was lost without God and I had no hope. But I want to tell you this, that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. 
I'm going to tell you that Jesus Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm going to tell you the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This morning, if an angel came through that ceiling and had no, listen, if an angel came down through this ceiling, had no means, he didn't pass through, he didn't have to walk through the door, just came straight through here. That angel stood here and glowing a pearl to you this morning. And so that angel said, I've just came in the presence of God, and I want to tell you that you don't have to, you don't have to trust Jesus Christ to go to heaven. Paul said, Let that angel be cursed forever and ever. If I come to this pulpit in the next few weeks and I get up here and I tell you folks that there's some other way to go to heaven besides Jesus Christ. Paul said, if I change my mind about it, you said, you let me be a curse forever. That's how settled the gospel is. It's settled forever. Hmm. I don't care if a man stood here and he's got so many degrees behind his name, you call him Dr. Fahrenheit. The gospel originated and stands for. Third thing, there's the sacrificial obtainment of the gospel. Jesus bought it. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me, the same text. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to verse number 4. Are you with me? Galatians 1, 4. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Who gave himself for our sins. He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God the Father and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He said, here's the Christ who gave himself for our sins. This is the sacrificial obtainment of the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Here's, here's the truth of the matter is this. Christ never sinned. Matter of fact, I don't believe he could sin. Impeccable, impeachable. But the Bible says this. Look at, listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him, God made Jesus, to be sin for us. Jesus who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, here is the sacrificial atonement of the gospel. Many remain unsaved because simply they don't know what Christ did. They don't realize it. They're religious, but they're lost. You see, the Bible says this in Acts 4, 12. Listen, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I want you to listen to me. Give me a special attention next minute and a half. Don't you know this morning that there had been other, some other way to save you besides God giving his son he would have done it are you going to tell me that God is going to allow his son to die such a horrible death and shed his life blood in agony at Calvary and then say uh oh there's some other way I can save you I wouldn't want to meet a God like that in the broad daylight I say unto you, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also the Greek. And I'm going to tell you something even better than that. God is powerless to save anybody without the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Did you hear me? God is powerless to save anybody apart from Calvary. Can't do it. Cannot be done. Will not be done. The saving operation of the gospel. Please look at verse number six with me. He said this, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that's called you to the grace of Christ, another gospel. It was grace that wrought salvation to you and me. What caused God to love you? What caused God to care about you? I won't tell you, it's just grace. Did you know? <laughs> we got a good crowd of people on Labor Day weekend. We got close to 600 people here. Did you know, if you knew everything about me, there's some things you wouldn't like. <coughs> there's some things in my past I'm glad you don't know. But you this morning, because of the grace of God, God loves me. And because of that same grace of God, God loves you. Simply by grace. There's not a one of us going to step to heaven and say, look here, God, how good I am. I made it. You can hang that up, honey. By the grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. In that grace he's given to us, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Amen? 
Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. It was seeking grace. Listen to me just for a second. It was seeking grace. You look at verse number 15. It says, who, my, God who separated from my mother's womb. Uh, Paul wasn't looking for God when he got saved. God was looking for Paul. Amen. Paul was going to kill Christians and the Spirit of God spoke to him. Listen to me. I wasn't seeking God one day. One, I want to tell you, thank God he got seeking after me. He came looking for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And I want to tell you that God's looking for you this morning. You're hearing you're lost without Christ. You didn't come here by accident. Who knew that on a Labor Day weekend I'd preach a simple salvation message by grace you're saved because God's been looking for you all this time. And God knew you had an appointment but someone's going to tell you of the saving grace of God. It's seeking grace. It's separating grace. He said he's separated from my mother's womb. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 121, I shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. It's saving grace. He said he called me into his service. He saved me. It's saving grace. He saved me by his grace. I'm saved by grace. Grace that just keeps working in my heart. No wonder, no wonder grace is called amazing as John Newton said amazing grace. It's sharing grace because he said when he wants me to preach the gospel to others in verse 16, Galatians 1, 16, did you see that? To reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the heathen. You know that God didn't save you just so you could go to heaven. That's not the only reason. He wanted you to tell other people about him. Amen? Now listen to me. It's a securing grace because it's free. You didn't earn it. You can't keep it. You know what's going to happen to you one day that are saved? I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to look what's going to happen to you one of these days. It's going to happen whether you, want, whether you like it or not. Look what it says in, in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 4 with me. Ephesians 2, 4. Just to the right of where you are in Galatians. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he... What? And when did he love us? Even when we were dead in sins, he's quickened us or made us alive together with Christ by how? By grace, you're what? And look what he's done for us. He's raised us up together. He's made us sit together where? Heavenly places. In other words, you're seated in heavenly places right now in Christ Jesus. Here's the reason why God's going to show you off in eternity as trophies of his grace in verse number seven. Then the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his goodness toward us through Jesus Christ. And then the verse that puts it off for us. For by what are you saved? Are you saved through faith and that not of yourself? It's the what? Because it's a, it's a securing grace. And let me just kind of say one more thing about it. It's sufficient grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul put it this way. To God puts it to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Almost, or many people in this room, the majority of people in this room are saved. Of that majority, almost 100% of that majority are saved. Never live their life without difficulties. You think, well, I'm going to get saved. I'm gonna have, I'll have this. I'll have that. I'll have a good marriage. I'll have this. I'm going to tell you, those things are not a promise. <coughs> but I want to tell you something, and I want you to listen to me closely. You've never had a tragedy You've never had a misery. You've never had a heartache. You've never had a difficulty. That God's grace wasn't sufficient enough to help you where you are. You never have. God has promised for us grace sufficient for every trial. For anything you may face, any difficulty you have, God's promised to give us strength for that trial. That's what's wonderful about Jesus Christ. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's surviving grace, Christ of glory. Because listen to me. Every tragedy, every heartache, every sorrow, every sickness, every separation, that one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. Amen? Listen to Romans 8, 8 18. For I reckon the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. No wonder the last person of amazing grace, John Newton said, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing his praise when we've first begun. Amen? Amen. It's that grace. And then let me just close with this. That Paul had a singular obsession. He preached it everywhere he went. 
Can you imagine Paul when he got before a king? You know what he did? He got before a king. He said, King, I want to tell you about it one day. I was on Damascus Road and this life, I got saved. Every king. Did you know if you'll read the book of Philippians, he started a church. You know how he started a church? Well, he started a church those at Philippi. They, many of them got saved. How would you like to go to this church? A lady who was a traveling sales lady got saved. A slave girl and a soldier. The first three members of that church. And then he starts a church there and he gets, he gets arrested. And he starts winning all these guards to the Lord. Can you imagine being fastened to the hand of Paul? He's your prisoner and you can't get away from him. He wants to talk to you about getting saved. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Here's these jailers and they come on guard and they said, Oh, did I tell you? Here we, now here's a, six, eight more hours of this. Why not? Because he had a singular obsession with the gospel. Things that's happened to me, he could say it's happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Listen to me, I have two more statements, two more things I want to tell you, and I'm through. There's three things that still the joy of every man or woman it's sin, sorrow, or death. I promise you, every sorrow you have, can you put it in one of those three categories? Sin, sorrow, or death. Science and education has made little advancement to erase these, these heartaches and sorrows and death. Some advancement, but little. What we've done, the age you and I live and where sin is, we've not done anything to help it. We've just renamed it. Haven't we? We've called murder, abortion. Some folks don't like that, but it's the truth. We call, uh, you know, drunkards uh, have just a problem, you know. Nothing's sin anymore. But the fact is, sin is just plumb sin. Come on. And sorrow. Heartaches continue to come in our society. Read the morning newspaper. Death. We've camouflaged it. We've covered it up. We've been able to postpone it with medicine. And I'm grateful for all medical procedures. I'll take everything I can to live longer. We call our graveyards memorial parks. We've done nothing. But I want to tell you, the gospel of the grace of God can save you from your sins, give you hope in time of sorrow, and give you victory when death comes. How do you beat that? Can't beat it, can you? I want you to imagine yourself with me this morning. If I can, as I close, I want you to imagine yourself with me that you've fallen off of an ocean liner out in the middle of the ocean. You've just fallen off an ocean liner, okay? Middle of the ocean. The ship you were on goes away. You're out here, and you're, you're perishing. You're doing all you can to, to stay afloat. All of a sudden, a high-speed boat pulls up beside of you, and a man leans over to where you are in that water, trying to stay alive, and he starts reading you a textbook, and he says, to swim, you must move both arms and legs. And uh, just keep trying. Make your feet go a little bit faster. You've got a teacher, but you haven't got a savior. Say so that guy pulls. Well, here comes another high-speed boat up to you. He pulls up to you, and here you are. You're trying to stay alive. And this guy jumps out of the boat, and he does this. He says, here's how you do it. You've got an example, but you don't have a savior. Let's say it. that guy pulls off. Here comes another boat. He pulls up to you. He reaches down, gets you, picks you up, puts you in the boat, looks at you, and throws you back in. Because <laughs> you didn't meet his expectation. You have a probation officer, but you don't have a savior. That's why a lot of people have in, in what they feel like Christianity. They lose it. But let's say somebody comes along, gets out of the boat, gets in the water where you are, puts the rope of hope around you, picks you up, puts you in the boat, takes you to the haven of rest. And that's what Jesus did. He came to you while you were in the mire and murk of your sin like I was. Through the rope of hope of grace around my soul, lifted me in the old ship of Zion and I'm headed safely for heaven's shore. That's a Savior. And that's who you need to know. 
Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You've been more than gracious to listen. I've never given a more serious invitation than I'll ever give. Now I give this one. Because the gospel of the grace of God is not something that you can ignore. It's not something you say, I can be neutral on it. No, you, you, you're, either, you're either in or you're out. So you'll not be neutral. Every, there'll be 600 decisions made this morning. I want to ask you just a simple few questions and we'll give an invitation this morning. I want you, no one looking around out of respect. No one's going to come and talk with you. No one's going to embarrass you. Have me quickly raise your hand and say, Pastor, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I've trusted Jesus Christ to save me as my own hope of heaven. And if I were to die or if he were to come, I know I'd go to heaven. I know that I'm saved. 100% sure. Would you raise your hand up high just for a second? I know I've trusted Christ. I know that. I want you to listen closely. I didn't say that to embarrass anybody. We didn't put that out to harm anybody. But if you don't know for sure if you died, you go to heaven. You did not come up by accident this morning. God wants you to know He loves you. And He paid for your sins at Calvary. He wants to see you saved. And He wants to save you this very moment. If you could not raise your hand, you know you're saved. There must be some question. And I believe there must be a want to in your heart that you'd want to know Christ. I believe that with all my heart. And I want you to do this with me. In the quietness of this few minutes, the Spirit of God spoke into your heart. You know you're lost because you couldn't raise your hand. You know you're saved. And you've come to the realization you cannot save yourself but you could be saved by trusting Christ. With no one looking around, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You can just pray it in your heart. You can pray it quietly, but sincerely in your heart. Right where you're seated, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I want you to forgive me of my sin and come into my heart and save me. I believe you died for me and you rose again. I trust you now to save me. There were probably a dozen people a while ago that could not raise your hand. You know you're saved. But if you prayed that prayer with me just then and in your seat, you trusted Jesus Christ to save you right where you're seated with no one looking around. Would you raise your hand up high where I can see it? Just put your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer and trusted Christ to save me. Would you put your hand where I can see it? Just for a second, you put it back down. Quick, you raise it up. Put it right back down. Okay? God bless you. Someone else. Pastor, I prayed that prayer. And I trusted Christ to save me. I got that thing settled in my heart. Someone else quickly. Okay? I see your hand. You can put it back down. Someone else quickly. Quickly. I prayed that prayer. Pastor, I trusted Christ to save me. Now, you never made a better decision than the decision you just made. And if you have not made that decision to trust Christ, I want to encourage you to do so. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I know I've preached basically to those who need to know Christ. I know many of our people in this room, I watched as you came in this morning, tried to pray for you. You're facing many difficulties in your life. And I want to tell you, the grace of God is sufficient for you. And God wants to help you. And the same, same grace that saved you is the same grace that wants to sustain you. I pray you'll come this morning as a child of God and you'll kneel somewhere and ask God to help you through the trial you're going through. They're playing for us on the instruments. Amazing grace would be good if you want to do that. Amazing grace. And if you need to come, well, others are coming. You slip out of your seat. You just slip out of your seat. You slip out of your seat. You can come. Ask God to help you. Ask God to give you strength. Ask God to give you grace. It's what you need. You slip out of your seat. You come on while we're waiting just a second. Other folks are coming. We'll wait on you. There's a place you can pray here. A place you can talk with God. God wants to help you. God wants to give you strength. He sure does. And He will. And He will. While we're waiting, we're waiting on you. You slip out of your seat. You come on now. You come on. Ma'am, could I get you to come? You just need to get that thing set in your heart. Sir, could I get you to come? Young person, would you come? 
you're not sure you're saved, but you want to get that settled. Listen, I'm not talking about being a Baptist. I'm talking about going to heaven, having that settled in your heart. Would you come while we're waiting? Would you come on? You get out of your seat. Go wait on you just for a second. If you need to come, you keep on coming while we stand and sing the first verse of Amazing Grace. You come while we stand, while we sing. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch Like me I once was lost But now they're playing for us our heads are bowed our eyes are closed just for a second now not going to embarrass not going to keep you long there's a decision you need to make if you've never trusted Christ you are trusting him this hour he's a wonderful savior I highly recommend him I want to tell you he'll do something for you no one else can do would you trust him this hour you just, you just don't know for sure you have questions you have some problems you have some doubts if you'll meet us here, we're not going to embarrass you. Take the word of God so you can be saved. How can you know it? You don't need an example. You don't need a teacher. You need a Savior. That's what you have in Jesus Christ. He wants to save you. He wants to be that one who is able to walk with you and talk with you and be your friend. Would you please come? Other Christians need to come. You slip out of your seat. You come while we're waiting. You come. You come. Let's sing another verse, Brother Harvey. One more verse. You come, please. Come on. Come on. When we been there ten thousand you come on while we're waiting just a moment bright shine come on as the sun with no less days to sing yes Play for us. Our heads are about our eyes are closed. If you're here this morning, you've been saved, but you've never made public at a church service what Christ has done for you. Or if you need to get baptized this morning, or if you need to set a time to get baptized, or if this is the church family that you are to be a part of, I want to encourage you to come and take uh, take advantage of those opportunities. There's this verse they're playing. You need to come. You make public you've been saved. You set a time to get baptized, get baptized, or unite with this church family. You come while they're playing for us. This verse is for you. You come. All right. You can be seated just for a second, please, if you would. I'm thankful of God's goodness and grace to us. Amen. Crystal Brocious. Crystal just had some doubts about our salvation for some time and just could never get it settled. But she said Wednesday night after church during an invitation, she came to trust Christ, and I'm grateful for that. She's making it public this morning. Amen. I'm grateful for that. I really am. She's going to get baptized here next week. We have about, I think, five or six going to get baptized. So we'll, we'll anticipate doing that as well. All right. If you would please, yes, it's wonderful. Uh, continue praying for Ronnie Wright. Brother Ronnie, his knee came out of joint the other day. He's walking up the steps. He's at the Oak Ridge Hospital Emergency Room. He's home now. Pray for Brenda. She's here this morning having cancer treatments. You pray for her. Ask God to give her strength. A special unspoken request this morning. And also I want you to pray for Jerry Lewis, Brother Jerry's mother. Jerry Lewis is one of the men that come here on Sunday nights uh, from Oak Ridge. But his mother passed away. And you need to pray for him. Pray for that family. Brother Harvey will take some other requests, then we'll have prayer together. Yes, Brother Keith, come ahead. Brother process. I have a couple cards this morning. One says, bless your heart for being so nice. Dear Mount Pisgah members, thank you so much for the visits, the cards, and prayers. 
While I was in the hospital, I hope to be back soon. Miss you all. Love in Christ. It's from Debbie Me. We need to continue to pray for Miss Debbie. And then a card that says, Dear church family, may God reward you. Love to you all. It's from Grace Borms. Also continue praying for the John Gann family. They buried Beth yesterday. Uh, I, I didn't hear all the ones that the preacher gave. Close. 